Welcome to God is Open. I'm your host, Christopher Fisher. Today on God is Open, we're going to be talking about the very interesting and crazy question why I, Christopher Fisher, am an open theist. And the answer to this might surprise you. It might shock you. It might bore you to death. And that's because today we're going to be talking about data, data analytics, the use and function of language, reading comprehension, right? If I'm ever in a debate and it devolves into philosophy and to us trying to talk about what's the best possible world, I failed in my job. I failed in my job. Every single one of my debates about biblical theology, what biblical theology entails, should devolve into reading comprehension, the use and function of language, or else I am not doing my job. For anyone who's familiar with my other work, I have another blog that is called Reality Is Not Optional. And the reoccurring theme in this blog is that our good ideas don't translate to the real world. We can't just wish what we want to be true onto the world and then the world mirrors what we want. We can't just say, this is what God should be like in in a perfect world. And then the world just automatically mirrors what we think it should look like. Reality doesn't work like that. There, there are rules that operate independently of our good ideas. And that's why like someone like in Venezuela, say you got a Venezuelan dictator who's trying to dictate prices. They say, oh, toilet paper needs to be sold for this price. What do you get? A shortage. They say labor must be bought for this price. What do you get? Unemployment. They say, oh, we got a problem. We don't have enough money. We'll just print more money. What, what you get is hyperinflation because our good ideas don't translate to reality. Reality isn't manipulatable. People can't just through fiat decide how the world works and operates. And you, you see this problem a lot in the real world, in politics. People think that other human beings are just pegs that they can move. In communist Russia, millions upon millions of deaths because people were treated not not as rational independently functioning human beings but pegs to be moved and when those pegs don't move how they wanted them to move their only solution they had left was to kill the pegs kill the pegs because the square peg can't be forced into the round hole so reality is not optional reality just doesn't just mirror whatever we want it to mirror And so when we come to the Bible, we need to take these principles and use it as our operating principles. The Bible needs to be treated in a straightforward manner. We can't just impose theology on the Bible. We can't take what we want the theology to be and maybe pull out some proof text from the Bible, say this little phrase means my theology that I want to believe, and then use those as guiding texts over the Bible. Instead, when we approach the Bible, we need to approach it rationally. We need to approach it reasonably. We need to take it for the genre of literature that it's presenting and read it as that genre of literature. And if we impose unique, special standards on it that only apply to the Bible and nothing else that we have experience to, what we're doing is we're creating a false reality, one that's unique to our own mindset, one that doesn't apply anywhere else except for the text of the Bible. We're creating a false world, a false reality. So that's why it's important to be consistent, to have standards, to have have principles that function even outside the Bible, to use common reading comprehension techniques, common methods of understanding, interpretation, and just reading altogether. And what I have pulled up here is the Epic of Gilgamesh, and this will serve as a guiding text that we could test our reading comprehension abilities against. Something that will will stop us from floating free in our own mind when we approach the Bible. Now, just to make clear, I am not saying that we use the Epic of Gilgamesh to interpret the theology of the Bible. I'm not saying that we take the spiritual world of the Epic of Gilgamesh and the Bible is that spiritual world, or the two have common overlap. Instead, what I'm saying is that our hermeneutics, our reading comprehension, should be transportable from one to the other. The way we treat one text is the way we should treat the other when we're just reading it like a normal reader would read a text. Because if we're taking the Bible and applying special, unique standards to the Bible that only apply with the Bible, what is happening is we're creating a reality in our own mind. One that one that has no picture to reality. One that's only unique in our own head. And there's no basis to say that 
the picture that I just created in my own head is the real picture. There's no basis to say that this is the correct way to read the Bible because you just created a unique standard. This is the fallacy of special pleading. What you need is something exportable, something that you are applying to everything equally. You need to be treating things equally and honestly. You need to be treating things like any other person would treat any text. What this also tells us is that when we are approaching the Bible, we are not approaching the Bible for what Chris Fisher believes. We're not approaching the Bible for what you yourself want to be believe or do believe about God. What we are doing is trying to read the Bible for what the original author intended to communicate to his original audience. And we can't presuppose that what he's trying to communicate is something that he doesn't himself believe, that he believes some special, unique, hidden truth that only we have access to. That's not how this works. What did the original author believe? What does the evidence tell us? What does the data present? Lay out the data and say, what is the best fit explanation for this range of data that we have access to? It doesn't matter what I believe. It doesn't matter Chris Fisher's personal theology. It doesn't matter Chris Fisher's personal take on philosophy and, and philosophical truths and metaphysics and the interplay of metaphysics and the Bible. And we don't care about that. Throw that in the trash. When we want to understand biblical theology, the only data set that we have to approach the Bible is the Bible itself. What does the original author say? And what does that tell us about their beliefs? So let's take the Epic of Gilgamesh. Let's, let's read this first line here. He who has seen everything. Oh, he who has seen everything. What does that mean? Is there someone who's omniscient here? And uh, what type of omniscience is it? In fact, this is talking about Gilgamesh, who is some sort of demigod or like a superhuman. It's a person, not even a real god in the text, but it says he has seen everything. So in what sense has he seen everything? We, we don't know yet, but, but right off the bat, we kind of understand that this is hyperbolic, that this is a generalization. He has seen everything. And do we, do we understand that the Bible has similar language? In Ecclesiastes, the author says over and over that he has seen everything under the sun. So a very similar language. And typically when we read Ecclesiastes, we take it in the common sense way that this guy's not saying, oh no, he's, he's omniscient and he watches the whole world at one time. He's seen everything that's ever happened in every detail. We understand that this is hyperbolic. And, and we understand that in the Bible, especially because it's being applied to a human being. But imagine if that text was applied to Yahweh, God, people would use it as a omniscience proof text, uh, omniscience that is uh, it's innately spawned in God, that he doesn't learn from outside of himself, and that, it, that meets this platonic idea of omniscience, whereas the phrase has nothing to do with that. It's just a hyperbolic generalization used of normal people, and we understand that. We read it naturally, as long as it's not about Yahweh God, right? So he who has seen everything, I will make known to the lands. This is the narrator speaking. I will teach about him who has experienced all things. And this all things is, again, hyperbolic. It's a generalization. We, we instantly understand that. We could instantly read that in the text. And it's, it's intuitive, right? Th this is how we read texts. Anu granted him the totality of knowledge of all. So what does that mean? Do, now he has omniscience, that Gilgamesh has all knowledge of all things. He's omniscient. Or, or does it mean that he was just given a lot of information about how the world works, how things work and operate, not even about all knowledge of all history and all micro detail. It's not about that. It's just about general knowledge. We see parallel concepts in the Bible. Turning to Daniel, we read this. As for these four young men, this is Daniel 117, God gave them knowledge and skill in all literature and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. What we understand here is just like in the Gilgamesh text, this this all knowledge, this all wisdom being taught to these people, it's not it's not really about uh, facts and figures and history. It's just about being skillful and knowledgeable in general areas and being just generally smart people. It's generalization. It's hyperbolic use of language. And we read that naturally in the text. We don't read this like, oh, now they're omniscient. Now they have all things at the forefront of their mind from all eternity, ungenerated knowledge 
that's not how we read those texts, and nor nor should we, because that's not natural to to how these phrases are used. Switching to the Numa Elish, we're going to re be reading about this god called Marduk. And what happens in the Numa Elish is it's an epic about the struggles of the various gods against each other. And Marduk, a spawned god, a created god, rises to prominence. And let's look at the language and how it's used of him. Marduk, it says that when he was made, he was rendered perfect. A double in with double Godhead. Imagine all the perfect language in the Bible applied to Yahweh. When when negative theologians, when James DeWessel comes across a statement that says God is perfect, in any context, it doesn't matter what the context is, he'll pull out that perfect language and see say, see, this this meets my idea of God is the perfect, most most perfect being that anyone could imagine. If we imagine change to God, if we imagine composition to God, that he's not God anymore. And this is his proof text, this perfect language. But here it's applied to a created being, right? So we, we can't automatically assume this language is about James DeWessel's ideas of perfection. The language has to be taken in context. What, what does the context say? And that will drive the interpretation of what it means. In this context, Marduk is just made very skillfully. He, ha he has a, he's maybe good physique or, or he's just a very... Uh, attractive God to behold. He's a very physically fit God. He's a very capable God. He's a God that has power to do things. Reading on, this is what Marduk says. He says, let my word instead of you determine the fates. Unalterable shall be what I, I may bring into being. Neither recalled nor changed shall be the command of my lips. And there's a lot of language like this about Yahweh in the Bible, where God says he cannot be opposed, where no one can thwart his will, where no one can change what he says to happen. And what does it mean in context? In the context of Marduk, what it's saying is that he's the most powerful being, and everyone listens to him, and as such, the, his will stands. It's not that it's a metaphysical absolute, that if all the other gods ganged up against him, then he couldn't be overthrown. What it is, is it's a generalization. It's a rule of thumb. It is, it's an idea that he holds the ultimate power. It's not even about incomparability, that he cannot be beaten. Instead, what it is, is it's a power claim, that he has the power, that other people cannot oppose them, unless, of course, extraordinary measures are taken. Let's listen to this. This is about Marduk still. Your decree is unrivaled. Your command is Anu. You, Marduk, are the most honored of the great gods. Your decree is unrivaled, your word is on you. From this day, your pronouncement shall be unchangeable. To raise or bring low, these shall be in your hand. Imagine a Calvinist comes across this type of language about God, and they say, oh, look, his decree is unchangeable. What that means is it's set, and there's no going back on it. You can't change it, and, and no one could oppose it, and not even God's going to change it. That's not what it's about. What it is about is it's a power statement that no one can oppose this great God. Not that it's a metaphysical impossibility that no one in any circumstance, not even God, can change that decree. The idea instead is ultimate power belongs to this Marduk in this context. And even in the context of Yahweh and Yahweh's power statements, it's always in the context of comparability. These statements about incomparability are in the context of being compared to other beings. Let's read in Act and Being. It says this, The question is repeated. To whom then will you compare God? What image will you compare with him? Isaiah 40, 18. To whom will you compare me? Who is my equal? Says the Holy One. Verse 25. The form of the question might clearly expect the answer, nothing. Yet the whole passage is set in the context of revealed theology of creation in which affirmations of a wholly positive kind are made about God's power as it is manifest in creative action. The God of this writer is known through his redemptive historical action. goes on to say this, This is an image, concrete and personal, with which God can be indeed be compared. Drawing on the tradition of God's redemption of Israel from Egypt, the prophet compares God to the one whose responsibility it was to redeem a family member from slavery, so that his critical theology is only directed against the idols and does not provide the basis of a kind of independent negative theology which we meet in the tradition. So this is the classic theology that people point to. They say, oh, God is incomparable, and that supports my perfect being theology about God, that God can't be composite, that God has to be absolutely simple, that God... 
God is uh, on this entire other level where he's ineffable and we can't know anything about God. You, the proof texts for that are found in passages about comparability that compare God to creation. And the idea is instead, instead of this idea that God is outside the world, that God is incomparable with existence, that he's, he's the inconceivable one of a Platonism. Instead, it's a, it's a language of comparability, that God is on another level, as is a professional football player is on another level other than me in, in regards to football. It, we, I am incomparable to, I don't know who's a famous football player like uh, Joe Montana. Uh, I might be really out of date here, but uh, he's way better than me. He's on another, another level. He's incomparable to me by virtue of being so much better than me that I pale in comparison. That's the way this language is used in the Bible, but it's taken and used for negative theology. We see how that language works. So already we are getting a taste of the basics of reading comprehension. Words don't have to be absolute. They, they're, they're not necessarily metaphysical. Context rules. And w what else rules? In, in the context of the Marduk Ascension story, the narrative rules. It talks about who he is, how he was created, how he rose to ascension. So the narrative rules the particulars. You don't grab the little statements, the little phrases, the little titles that are applied to him, the little statements, oh, your commands are unchangeable. You know all things. You know all the secrets of the heart. You don't take those little statements and then reinterpret the narrative to fix fit that, that you don't say, oh, Marduk is this uh, incomprehensible, unchanging God of pure simplicity and pure perfection. And then all this other language it's meant to be taken as some sort of condescension language. That's, that's the exact opposite way of uh, how you honestly treat the text. But that's precisely how people approach the Bible and they come to the Bible. People like, let's take John MacArthur, for example. I got a quote pulled up from him here, and he talks about God's omniscience. And he talks about it in a very metaphysical way. He wants this metaphysical absolute God, which can't gain in knowledge in any way. He says this, God's knowledge is also perfect, never increasing. Isaiah 40, 13 through 14. And so let, let's read a little bit of context. We're going to start at verse 12, but uh, he wants us to focus on 13 and 14. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his head? Okay, so so right away, MacArthur's proof text has God counting to know. God counts the water in the hollow of his head. And is that uh, a metaphor, the, the hollow of his hand, just saying that, or is it like talking about a literal hand? Uh, the context is not clear on that, but but we do know that it is about counting to know the water. He counts the water and therefore he knows it. He's measured the heaven with a span and calculated the dust of earth in a measure. So this is all about God acquiring information. He's weighed the mountains in the scales and the hills in the balance. So God has measured, God has calculated, and God has gathered information. So this is this is the context of John MacArthur's proof text for God not being able to acquire information. Reading his proof text, who has directed the spirit of the Lord, or as his counselor has taught him? And so it's, it's a rhetorical question. And what's the rhetorical effect? What's he going for? Is it going for this pure knowledge that MacArthur wants? Is it going for God cannot ha acquire any information from any source in any, in any respect? God is perfectly omniscient of all things and all facts from time eternity, from this knowledge that is unspawned and ungenerated. Or, or is the more natural reading that this is just about a comparability statement, just like we read in relation to Marduk, that he's unopposed and he, he reigns supreme and he's incredibly intelligent and people can't just teach him how to do things. They're not they're not out there saying, oh, you're incompetent, God, and let me teach you the right stuff. Instead, it's about God's power, God's majesty, God's status. It says this, with whom did he take counsel and who's instructed him and taught him in the path of justice? Who taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? So this is about people inferior to God, uh, leading and guiding God. This is not about, this is not invalidating all the times in the Bible where people query God, people talk to God, people get God to do things that God wasn't originally planning. It's not about that. It's not about reasoning with God. It's about God being led around like an insignificant, God being led around by a menial. It's saying, that's not how God operates. God is the superior in all these interactions. God is the one who knows better. God is the one who is in control. God is the sovereign. Is it about metaphysics or is it about comparable sovereignty? 
which of the two seems more likely in context. It says this, Behold, the nations are as a drop in the bucket and are counted as small dust on the scales. Look, he lifts up the isles as a very little thing. So it's all about power in context. God counts. God God acquires information. He, he does these mighty power acts that we can't even imagine doing. And then it talks about we can't teach him things. And then it talks about how the nations are nothing compared to him. It's all about comparability. It's not about this negative theology that MacArthur wants to impose on the text. So right away, we're seeing these very different ways to treat the Bible. We could treat the Bible in an unintuitive way, like John MacArthur, where you're looking for proof texts, and those proof texts overrule the context, and those proof texts are automatically assumed to mean your own specific special theology, rather than letting the context dictate what those proof texts mean. Or you could read the Bible in the same way you'd read any other ancient text, in context. And what is the context of Isaiah? God pleading with Israel. God trying to get Israel to change. God reaching out to a recalcitrant people, trying to, doing all he can. Remember in Isaiah 5 where he says, what more could I have done? I had done everything to try to get you guys to move, to react to me, to, to respond to me. I built a wine press expecting good grapes, but I got sour grapes. It's about God learning, interacting, uh, struggling with Israel. And no, they can't oppose him. They can't uh, thwart God and overthrow God. That's that's not what it's about. Instead, they can oppose his will. They can refuse to do his commands. And then what does he do? Because he's sovereign, he punishes them. He puts them into exile. That's the context of Isaiah. This is not the God that John MacArthur is trying to put forth. This is not the Calvinist God that controls all things. This is not the God who has all inherent knowledge from all eternity and has no change in, in his knowledge. It's not about that. The Contextually, that's not what's happening in the narrative. And here's where modern theologians massively, massively err. And this is how they get off in their own little worlds that are floating free from the text because they, they turn to what they think are uh, texts that rule other text. They turn to what they say is didactic text. These are the texts that teach us the true theology. And what do these phrases mean? The theology that we have in our own mind, the negative theology that God is unchanging and outside of time and has this eternal ungenerated knowledge. We don't don't care what the actual text says in context. It could be a text about God being in heaven and seeing everything on earth. And they'll say, well, God's not actually in heaven. Oh, God doesn't actually see information to learn it. Instead, this is a proof text for my idea that this knowledge is ungenerated and in God eternally from outside of time. That, that's how these people do theology. But this is an invalid, improper way of doing theology. And one thing that I have dedicated a lot of my time to, a lot of my effort, is, is to make a list of what I call counterproof texts. And what a counterproof text is, is it is a verse that uses very similar or the exact same phrases and uh, statements that these proof texts do. People will come to a proof text and they'll say, oh, God inhabits eternity. And what this means is God is outside of time and timeless and unchanging and and living in an eternal now. But there's statements in the Bible where other people inhabit eternity. And what this tells us is that their reading of this verse is forced, that it's uh, unintuitive. And the only reason they're reading it this way in that context is because they want it to mean their specific theology rather than letting context and uh, and the normal phrasing dictate because they, they don't come to these conclusions when it says this psalms thirty seven twenty nine the righteous shall inherit the land and dwell forever upon it and that phrase is inhabits eternity the same phrase that's used in isaiah fifty seven fifteen that they take for God being timeless it says the the righteous inhabit eternity Oh, but we can't read it like that because we understand the righteous are people and they're living in time and subject to temporal things. Oh, but the same phrase applies to God. Oh, let's just assume it's about our theology and and not even just say, well, this could mean our theology. They use it as their defining proof text for their theology. That's the bad thing. They, they turn to a proof text that says that uh, 
God is the same today, yesterday, forever. There, there's one about Jesus that says that too. And it's obvious that Jesus had changes. Jesus acquired knowledge. Jesus grew up. Jesus was crucified and raised again. It's not about immutability. The proof text is not about that. It's about a specific feature in context. But no, we need a proof text. And so we'll t- turn to these proof texts about being the same today, tomorrow, forever. And we'll make it about platonic immutability rather than allowing the context to dictate what specifically that's about. I, the Lord, do not change. And then he says, return to me and I'll return to you. And it's about a change in context. And so you pulling these short, tiny statements out of context and then using it to override the context is an invalid, improper way of doing theology. And what, what I really like to do is, especially in relation to omniscience, all these omniscience texts where God acquires information, God sees to know, God learns, and God's looking and watching the world. And people will assume a very different knowledge on God. They'll assume that this knowledge is eternally spawned in God, independent of the world. God doesn't look into the future to know. Oh no, that would violate their idea of omniscience. And, and their idea of omniscience is God can not, never acquire knowledge. So if God sees to know, that's acquiring knowledge. That's open theism. So God's knowledge has to be ungenerated. And then they turn to all their proof texts in the Bible and zero, zero proof texts in the Bible describe this. All the proof texts are about God testing to know, God doing to know, God uh, looking to know, God watching. And here's the funny thing, and this is really funny. The Bible not only describes what God knows, but it describes how God knows it. God acquires it from sources outside of self. That's pretty regular in the text that it talks about God acquiring the knowledge and the method of doing so. And people will come to the Bible and they'll say, oh, no, God can't acquire knowledge. Where is that in the Bible? Where is that in the Bible? We, we already looked at one of the proof texts. It's very incredibly forced. People want to impose their theology on the Bible rather than deriving their theology from the Bible. And so what I do with these counterproof texts, going back to this counterproof text idea, is I will take those similar phrases. They'll say, oh, this one little phrase means my negative theology. And I'll say, no, that's not what it means. And look at this very similar phrase applied to something else that you can readily admit is not about your negative theology because it would render all your ideas of reading comprehension uh, just totally insane. You know, you don't believe that that King David had omniscience of all things from all eternity, even though there are statements in the Bible that King David has knowledge of all things. In order to change the course of things, your servant Joab did this. But my Lord, who's King David, has wisdom like the wisdom of the angel of God to know all things that are on the earth. So King David knows all things that are on the earth. What this means is not that he's omniscience, it's been eternally spawned, he doesn't acquire it from outside himself. Instead, this just means he has general knowledge of all things. He's, He's got... And not not all facts at the forefront of his mind at all times, but just that he's a fairly knowledgeable guy and he's been enabled by God to have this knowledge. Luke says this, It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write to you an orderly account. This doesn't mean that Luke has had perfect knowledge of all of human history, perfect perfection that that uh, uh, amidst no details of every single cat walk throughout history where like there's a cat and the cat's walking through some sand on some desolate beach. And now Luke is saying that he has that knowledge. That's not what this is about. What it is contextually is about him having general knowledge, not necessarily perfect perfection knowledge, but very good and very accurate knowledge of the ministry of Jesus. And then after him, the ministry of the 12 and of Paul. He just has pretty good knowledge, and that's what it's about. Contextually, it's limited to a subject matter. Context rules. You can't pull a small phrase out of context and then apply onto that extraordinary meaning. Language doesn't function that way. Language doesn't work that way. One last funny example of this counterproof texting. Remember the Matt Slick story where Matt Slick was talking to me directly. We're having a face-to-face conversation in person. And he turns to 1 John 3.20 to prove his idea of God's omniscience. And of course, it's a platonic idea of an omniscience. And 1 John 3.20 says this, For if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. And I said, 1 John 2.20, man knows all things. 1 John 2.20 says this, but you have the anointing of the Holy One and you know all things. And Matt Slick just, uh, he wigged out. 
That's funny. When you when you talk about these counterproof texts and these people act like they've never heard or they've never never heard these verses in their life. They've they've never encountered them and never considered them in their life because they haven't. They're so myoptically focused on their own theology that they discard and abandon normal reading comprehension. So much so that when they are confronted with their same theological phrases that they champion for their special theology, the same phrases used for man, the same phrases used for other people, other beings, that they don't know how to deal with it. They say, oh, God has uh, unlimited wisdom. And this is an infinite uh, countless. Well, well, Joseph collected infinite grain. And they'll be like, oh, well, they won't know how to respond. And the point is that it's, it's, they can't force their theology into the text. They can't be grabbing these little, little proof texts. They can't be grabbing these little statements and just assume their theology. So what does rule? Uh, what does rule? We're, we're, we're getting a, we're at maybe half an hour already. How do we read the Bible? How do we read what's going on? How do we understand who Yahweh is in the Bible? We read the narrative. What do the stories say? Let's go through just a brief history of the Bible. God creates the world. All right. And God watches his creatures. He interacts with his creatures. He has curiosity for his creatures. They fail him and he expels them from the garden, right? And then what happens? All of mankind fall. And this is after God warns them. He says that... Uh, uh, you control sin. Sin is crouching over you and you need to control it. And then they don't control it. And then God watches the world become wicked. And then he regrets. He regrets his own action in making mankind and resolves to destroy the world. But then after that, he resolves not to destroy all of the world, but save alive one man and his family and creatures. And he attempts to reach the world through this one man, through this recreation. But mankind keeps rejecting God, such that God decides to reach humanity through a people group, through a lineage of Abraham, his beloved, because, as he says, Abraham's going to teach his children. And because of Abraham's love and care for his children, Abraham's children will care and love God. But that didn't, that didn't materialize, did it? it? It turned out to instead be a struggle between God and man, God and Israel throughout the Bible. The entire Bible is this love, give and take relationship between Israel and God, where God keeps reaching out and pressing towards Israel and Israel keeps rejecting and pushing him away. God and his love relationship that he so much desires is thwarted time and time again. He goes through cycles of of anger, of regret, of uh, sadness, of uh, vengeance, and he gets he gets satisfaction through his vengeance. Ezekiel eighteen is this story, and it's uh, the story in the most vivid, descriptive manner. This is who Yahweh is. This is who the God of the Bible is. It's not this timeless, immutable, above emotions, this Vulcan logic creature, this input output robot. God is a person, a living, acting, a breathing. Is he breathing? Yeah. Let's talk about those stone idols, who he mocks throughout the Bible. It's a consistent theme that the stone idols, they can't see. They have eyes, but cannot see. They have noses, but cannot smell. They got mouths, but cannot talk. They got hands, but cannot do anything. They cannot do these things, but Yahweh God can, because God does have all these things. And God manifests from time to time. He interacts with people. He talks to Moses face to face as a man would his friend. There's a strange interaction where Moses wants to see God in his glory. So God places him in a cleft of the rock, covers him with his hand, and passes by so that Moses sees his backside because his face, God's face, would kill Moses. There are people brought to heaven to see God in heaven. And they, they worry. They're like, oh no, I just saw God face to face. I am going to die. But then they're purified by coals. There's Paul talking about people who are brought to heaven in body or spirit. He doesn't know. This is who God is. God is interactive. God acts. God reaches out to mankind. God is in history, intimately involved in history, so much so that he guides the course of historic events. The movements of the nations are attributed to God. Israel, Israel being invaded, Israel in captivity, all God's work, all God's planning. 
God is doing. Why is he doing it? Because they have fallen away from them. They have violated their portion of the covenant. And time and time again in the Bible, God is accused of violating his side of the covenant. In the Psalms, God, where are you? Your righteous are dying day and night, and you sit by idly. And then God responds. God reaches out to fulfill his portion of the covenant. It's a give and take relationship. Each party has their side to fulfill. It's not a stone idol. It's not a God who can't receive anything unto himself. So let's look at, before we go, one specific narrative. And narratives have to be envisioned in their own story worlds. You can't be importing from outside the story principles that are not themselves in the story. You can't be reading Paul and pulling out what you think Paul is saying and then imposing it on a story that we find in Genesis or Exodus and saying, oh, the Exodus author had this concept that Paul is saying and the concept that Paul is saying is my concept that I invented in my own head based on these short phrases. No, it doesn't work like that. The narrative is self-contained. So what does the narrative say? Let's read the narrative and see the motivations, let's see the actions, let's see the characters, let's see the plot twists, let's see who's thinking what and when and why things happen. Exodus 32. I have a whole podcast on Exodus 32. This is Open Theist's most clear and concise and uh, very powerful proof text. Why? I'm going to give it away up front before we could trap people. And it's easy to trap people because uh, the people who engage in negative theology who don't actually believe the Bible and they don't eat, treat the Bible honestly. And they'll say, oh, all these things. Uh, Moses' prayer was only for Moses' sake. It didn't do anything for God. It didn't change God's mind. Oh, God has all this omniscience where all this knowledge is at God's forefront of his mind at all times. So, of course, Moses' reasoning to God was already at the forefront of God's mind such that it rendered Moses' reasoning obsolete. Well, did Moses think this? Is that is that Moses' interaction where he's coming to God and he's the guy who talked to God face to face in the very text that we're talking about. Is that Moses' reasoning? Is that Moses' idea of God while Moses is interacting with God? Or, or is Moses an open theist? Does Moses think that his petitions can actually reach God? That the future is not set and the things that he says and does and his arguments are valid and will be taken seriously by some th- someone who has not yet considered them? Let's, let's read what happens here in the text. And the Lord said to Moses, Go get down, for your people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt has corrupted themselves. He's saying it's your people. Oh, it's so funny. The, the turns of phrases in here. If you are not paying attention to what's happening, you are missing a lot of the text. If you're presupposing your theology, you're missing a good deal of nuance. Moses, Moses, it's it's his people. God is saying, Moses, this is your people. Your people have corrupted themselves. And Moses' counterargument is like, no, God, this is your people. They're not my people. They're your people. Your people, Lord. And so God is trying to trying to distance himself from this people. He's trying to say, these are not my people, Moses. They're your people, and you're responsible for these people, and they're bad. I'm just going to kill them all. I am fed up. I am done with them. And he says, they have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made themselves a molded calf and worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, This is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and in Indeed, it is a stiff-necked people. Now, therefore, let me alone, and my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them, and I'll make of you a great nation. So he gives them a contingency plan. He tells Moses that his promises to Abraham are going to be fulfilled through Moses. He's going to still perform those promises, but he has an innovative new plan that will technically allow him to fulfill the promise, but not with this people, not with these evil people who have done nothing deserving of uh, his his salvation. His wrath is described in a quote by Yahweh. Yahweh is talking about his anger. And Moses just doesn't discard this information. He doesn't throw it in the trash. Oh God, you are impassable. You can't have emotions. You can't feel wrath or anything like that. We know that you are stoic and you deal with things like a Vulcan. No, he actually assumes God is being legitimately honest here. God is saying what he thinks and what he feels and his motivations are revealed. God is angry, so he's going to kill him. And then Moses says this. It says, then Moses pleaded with the Lord his God and said, Lord, 
why does your wrath burn hot against your people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt? Does that sound like Moses is like a uh, Calvinist or Arminian who thinks that God is like unchanging and simple and, and totally devoid of emotion? That doesn't sound like that at all. Moses is not one of those people. Moses is an open theist. In this text, in the writer of Exodus is telling us who God is and who Moses thinks God is. In this text, all we have to do is read it and we'll understand the narrative is explicit. We're not pulling little phrases out of context. Everything is reinforced by other verses in context. God is angry. God wants to destroy them. Moses says God's angry. Moses pleads for God not to destroy them. In fact, everything in the text supports this narrative. This is funny. Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? So two things here. Moses is reversing this to God. God says, this is your people, Moses, that you're leading. And Moses says, no, God, this is your people who you are leading. And you just you just saved all these people. So you're going to just save these people just to kill them again? Oh, great. That's a grand idea, right? He says, why should the Egyptians speak and say, he brought them out to harm them, to kill them in the mountains and consume them from the face of the earth? He's saying, God, if you do this, all the Egyptians are going to say, well, what, what a great God that was. He just has a people and it's his special people and he just brings them out to the wilderness and kills them. It's like a death cult. And uh, Moses is saying, God, that's terrible. You'll look, you'll look awful. All the pagan nations will think you're not a very good God, that you're a death cult God and you just destroy your own people. He says, turn from your fierce wrath and relent from this harm to your people. Repent from this harm because he thinks that God is going to harm the people. So God needs to repent of the harm that God intends per Moses' dialogue. This is what Moses thinks God will do. He says this, this is, this is the third argument. Remember, the first argument is that God just spent all his mighty acts saving this. Oh, then, then also the argument that this is God's people. It's your people. So there's two arguments. The third argument is you'll look terrible to the pagan nations. Fourth argument, remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants to whom you have swore by yourself and said to them, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven. You remember, God has already offered an innovative plan to fulfill this. But Moses is appealing to a more common sense interpretation of this promise, an interpretation that involves current Israel, a current uh, population that's already spawned, that's already created a basis to this promise. He's appealing to this eternal promise, even though the objection's already been answered. And he's reinforcing to God how God should fulfill this promise. And I said to them, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven. Moses is saying, you promised to multiply the descendants. Here they are in front of you and you're going to kill them. Why start over? You already got the people. Use this people. They're your people, Lord, who you saved, who you brought out of Egypt. And then it says this. So the Lord relented, which is repented. You know, uh, the Calvinist translators like to use relent instead of repent. So Moses says that you should repent. He says, turn from your fierce wrath. He says, uh, turn from your fierce wrath and repent from harm to your people. And then in the couple verses later says, so the Lord repented from the harm, which he said he'd do to his people. So what's the text communicating? It's reinforcement of this idea that God was really angry, that God really wanted to harm his people. And then God really repented. God changed his mind based on what? This interaction where Moses pleads to him with a series, a cascading list of arguments. So that's the narrative, and that's the narrative. And how do people take this narrative? They want they want to have their cake and eat it too. They want to say, oh, we want to consider this uh, historical text, but it can't mean what it says because God doesn't learn new information. God doesn't repent of things that he thought he was going to do. God doesn't burn in anger. God's information doesn't work like that, where he can become riled up by things that he experiences. Because remember, all God's knowledge has to be timeless and eternal. And so it's it's not like, it'd be like us watching the same movie for like the 50th time in a row. Um, the same emotions are not going to spawn because that knowledge is more, more passive to us. It's not actively playing on our emotions. We've already internalized that knowledge such that it's not going to affect us in this massive way that this text describes. Instead, God sees the people become wicked. God becomes very furious and angry. He tells Moses that he's furious and angry. Moses takes him at his word, argues 
that not only is God furious and angry, but God should repent of that for various reasons. And then the text describes that repentance. So someone who doesn't want to accept this text will find ways to mitigate it. They'll find rationales. Oh, this is a prayer for Moses' sake. Where in the text is that? Where do you get that from the text? What, what in context would lead you to that conclusion? Is there anything in, in context that could even suggest that? Uh, no. And, and then here's, here's why this text is so brilliant and genius. Because this is a major event in Israel's history such that people in the future comment on it. It's not a text in isolation. So we got future biblical authors writing in the Bible about this event and describing what happened in this event. And is it ever in any sort of way that that the negative theologian, the, the person who wants to affirm omniscience of all future events, it, do they take it in that fashion? They don't. They read it like a normal human being would. They read it naturally like you and I would if we weren't laden down with our presuppositions. Here's an interesting text. It's from Ezekiel 28. But they rebelled against me and would not obey me. They did not all cast away the abominations which were before their eyes, nor did they forsake the idols of Egypt. Then I said, I will pour out my fury on them and I will fulfill my anger against them. Fury, angry. God was mad. God was angry. But I acted for my name's sake, that it should not be profaned before the Gentiles. Remember, that was one of Moses' arguments, that uh, these Egyptians are going to see you just killed all your people, and it wouldn't look very good. And God says this, But I acted for my name's sake, that it should not be profaned before the Gentiles, among whom they were, and whose sight I have made myself known to them, to bring them out of the land of Egypt. God is saying, I repented for the argument that Moses gave me. Deuteronomy Deuteronomy 9 is Moses recalling this event. This is Moses. He says, I was afraid of the anger and hot displeasure which the Lord was angry at you to destroy you. God was going to destroy him. God intended to destroy him. But the Lord listens to me at that time also. He listened to him. He, Moses said stuff and the God listened and uh, changed his mind. And the Lord was very angry with Aaron and would have destroyed him. So I prayed for Aaron also at that time. Moses changed God's mind. Moses influenced God. God was going to do something, but then he was convinced otherwise. Psalms 106, 23. Therefore, he said that he would destroy them had not Moses, his chosen one, stood before him in the breach to turn away his wrath, lest he destroy him. So Moses was a critical figure. God's wrath was driving motivation for his actions, which Moses mitigated by standing in as, as an advocate for Israel. And how did he advocate? With arguments, with reason, trying to calm God down, trying to talk talk logic and reason to God, arguments which God ultimately accepted. Not for Moses' sake. This wasn't a prayer for Moses. God often repents in the Bible for his own sake. It tells us why God repents. It's not always because, oh, it's just, it's just a positional change because the people repent and therefore their standing with God changes. No, God repents for his own sake. God repents for uh, Moses' sake here. Not for the people. The people didn't change at all. It's not a change because the people came back to him and it's a positional change and God's unchanging, anything like that. No, God changed because of Moses and Moses' arguments and Moses act, acting as an intercessory between God and man. God repents and he tells us why he repents often. And it's and it's not over, always because of changes in people. Sometimes it's for his own sake. Sometimes it's because he's just sick and tired of all this cycle of violence, that he's he's weary. He's, he's tired. He's worn out by having to deal with the same things time and time again. This is what we see consistently in the Bible, in the biblical story, in the biblical narrative, and it plays out in the events that are described. This is what I'm talking about. The events are what matters. The, the narratives are what control the text. Just as when we're reading Enuma Elish, the narrative is the controlling factor. It's not the titles that can be taken out of context that obviously, obviously, if you have any familiarity with the text, these vague phrases, these vague titles are not the controlling things. They're not the didactic texts that teach us the true nature of Marduk. The narratives do. The narratives of the Bible teaches about Yahweh, who Yahweh is, who Israel worshiped. That is why I am an open theist.